please stand as we begin worship this morning. today comes from Hebrews chapter 4 verses 14 through 16. It says, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our fast our confession and let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. Please continue singing with us.
uh, made themselves available um, to be known and to be loved and to love back uh, for all of the, the goodness that you have done uh, through their life and through their family, and we thank you for it. And we know that there was much prayer that went into what life would look like at the end of residency and what job opportunities to take and what cities to go to. And we thank you that the door has opened for them to return from whence they came, to be back near family in the Northwest, um, that we, uh, you know the, the, the sorrow on our part in um, their departure and the void that they will leave. And so uh, we thank you for the gift uh, that they are to us, and we do pray that you would help them in this transition as you've already done in the sale of a home, but all the details that still need to transpire before they, they make the road trip west, that you would work those out, that you would allow them to mostly in this busyness reflect on your faithfulness to them as a family, and that as they make a new home, that you would help them to discover a new church family to be plugged into and a new community of uh, friends to deepen and develop relationships with, and for even Greg's new job as he begins that, that he would sense uh, your blessing upon the work of his hands, that he would know that he worships you through how he does his work, and we thank you already for the many families of young kids that will be blessed um, as they encounter him as the one entrusted with their care. And so we thank you for them, and we uh, pray that, yes, your peace would be upon them, that they would sense your face of joy and delight shining over them, being with them for every step of the way. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you give them a round of applause? And at this time, uh, being the last Sunday of the month, we also take as an opportunity as a church family to remember the sacrifice specifically of our Savior on our behalf through the celebration of communion and the remembering of his broken body and his shed blood for us. And primarily we do that where we invite the congregation to come forward. If you are someone who claims faith in Christ and acknowledge his body broken and blood shed for you, even if you're not a part of the regular family here at Lakeside and might just be visiting us, we still invite you to participate and to come forward. If you're someone here today and you don't believe in Jesus and you're not sure where your relationship is with him, we uh, invite you not to come forward, but just to take this as a quiet moment of reflection for you. And if, uh, if coming forward is physically uh, difficult for you, we just ask you to raise your hand and someone in the back will come and bring um, both the, the bread and the cup to you uh, where you are. Um, but at this time, I'll invite from the front to come and come down the center aisle uh, to grab one of each and then return to your seat and hold on to it until everyone has had a chance to come forward. read from Isaiah 52 and 53. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human resemblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. And so shall he sprinkle many nations Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed what they heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our Iniquities upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. And when his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide with him a portion with the many. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. And yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. And Paul gives us the instruction in 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. same way also he took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes let us again pray Heavenly Father we thank you that we can remember how great your love is for us, how great a sacrifice you were willing to pay, that even in a week where we acknowledge many needs within our congregation, where as a church family we've seen a dear sister, Elizabeth Pfeiffer, enter into her eternal reward and enter into your presence, that we can celebrate what happened to your son because we know that you were victorious over death and victorious over the grave and that because of your sacrifice not only do you live forever but that you offer eternal life to all who believe so we pray for the Pfeiffer family as they grieve the loss of a mother and a grandmother a great grandmother and as we grieve the loss of a dear sister but we thank you for the joy and the hope that we have to know that the bond experienced in Christ can never be broken, not by time, not by space, not by death itself. And again, we thank you for the Cooper family. And as we know that there will now be a distance, we thank you for the good news that there is no separation from your love and what binds us together in Christ. And so we pray that through your word, you would show us wonderful things that we need for all the various um, encounters that we've experienced and that only you know are ahead of us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I invite you now to take a Bible and to open it to the book of Judges. Judges chapter 13, which is on page 213, if you're using one of the Bibles provided for you there in the pew. 
We'll read Judges chapter 13 in its entirety. We are beginning the story of Samson. And Mark Kuyper will conclude the story of Samson next Sunday morning for us. It actually spans uh, four to five chapters, and so we can't go over his story uh, in detail. But if you grew up going to church um, and going to some form of a Sunday school or a VBS, you might remember certain aspects of his story of having long hair, of being really strong. And then there's always the experience when in your adult life you then read all the details. <laughs> And you encounter it at a totally different level. Um, because as we get older and as we're more mature, we, we can think and process information a little bit more differently and hopefully better uh, with time. Uh, yesterday, just uh, humorously, um, I was driving the boys to the boys' workshop, which was um, a switch in plans from the normal routine. We went out to do a train ride yesterday afternoon. And I didn't map it out beforehand, but on the way to the train ride, I realized, oh, we we're going to drive right past where Amy and I got married. And I was thinking about it, and I, didn't, I couldn't remember any time that we had driven past it with the boys to say, hey, look, this is the place that Mommy and Daddy got married. But when we drove past Weymouth Country Club, I was prepared, and so I said, hey, I want you guys to look over at this building once we get past these trees. And so they did, and I said, this is where Mommy and Daddy got married, and I've got three and a half and a five and a half year old and they're like oh wow and they've seen the picture so they could put that all together but then we also had their six and a half year old cousin with us so then he said oh and then you kissed on the lips <laughs> I said, yeah and he goes that's disgusting <laughs> I said yep that's where we got married right over there <laughs> but visible that with each uh, age category more information comes out and when you read the story of Samson and you read it in all of its detail, there, are, there is much to it that surprises you that uh, what was maybe presented as sort of a, a hero uh, and an amazing person has a profound level of flaws and things that are realities in, in his life that just puzzle you. And w I'm not going to go into any of that today. Mark gets to handle that next Sunday. We're just going to talk about his birth today. Um, and so I get the easier assignment, but Judges chapter 13. And the people of Israel, again, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And so the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. There was a certain man of Zorah of the tribe of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had no children. And an angel, the angel of the Lord, appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Therefore be careful, and drink no wine or strong drink, and eat nothing unclean, for behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. And then the woman came and told her husband, A man of God came to me, and his appearance was like the appearance of the angel of God, very awesome. I did not ask him where he was from, and he did not tell me his name, but he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. So then drink no wine or strong drink, and eat nothing unclean, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. And then Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, please let the man of God whom you've sent come again to us and teach us what we're to do with the child who will be born. And God listened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came again to the woman as she sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. And so the woman ran quickly and told her husband, Behold, the man who came to me the other day has appeared to me. And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said to him, Are you the man who spoke to this woman? And he said, I am. And Manoah said, Now, when your words come true, what is to be the child's manner of life? And what is his mission? And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Of all that I said to the woman, let her be careful. She may not eat of anything that comes from the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink or eat anything unclean all that I commanded her let her observe Manoah said to the angel of the Lord please let us detain you and prepare a young goat for you and the angel of the Lord said to Manoah if you detain me I will not eat your food but if you prepare a burnt offering then offer it to the Lord for Manoah did not know that he was the angel of the Lord and Manoah said to the angel of the Lord what's your name so that when your words come true we may honor you and the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask my name, seeing that it is wonderful? 
And so Manoah took the young goat with a grain offering and offered it on the rock to the Lord, to the one who works wonders. And Manoah and his wife were watching. And when the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord went up in the flame of the altar. And now Manoah and his wife were watching, and they fell on their faces to the ground. The angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and to his wife, and then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, We shall surely die, for we have seen God. But his wife said to him, If the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering at our hands, or shown us all these things, or announced to us such things as these. And the woman bore a son and called his name Samson, and the young man grew... The Lord blessed him, and the Spirit of the Lord began to stir in him in Mahanadan between Zorah and Eshtol. And that's where we'll conclude our reading for this morning. If you've been with us the entire time we've been in the book of Judges, it's starting to feel repetitive. <laughs> Opening another chapter and hearing that again the people did what was evil in the sight of the Lord is in fact a pattern in the book. The book covers a couple hundred years of Israel's history, and so some of the information is truncated for us, but because of that, there is sort of a pattern of a cycle of the people doing what is evil and then facing consequences because of that, usually then in the form of oppression, and eventually someone is raised up. And one of the themes in that is not just the reality of cycles that take place, <clears throat> but even in the good things that happen, there is a limit to political victory. You could say the book of Judges is sort of this apologetic book to announce to the people there are limits to political victory. And it's, I've chosen that specifically. It's not just that there are limits to politics. There are limits even to political victory. When a new leader comes into power and is able to implement a variety of change, the book of Judges is not dismissive of that. And all of Scripture is not dismissive of concerns that all of us should have, not only for ourselves, but for the communities that we live in. And to be concerned about that is to be engaged in political conversation. I mean, the Ten Commandments, as they're given us in telling us to love God and to have no other images and to worship Him alone, then point us towards honoring father and mother, with then a greater sense of honoring the elderly among us, and then further from that, not... Um, taking anyone's life, not stealing from anyone, not envying their things. And all of that is connected to saying, if we love people, we have to also love the things that they need to sustain life and flourishing. You can't say, I love you and I don't care about the environment that you're in, or I love you and I don't care about how you're going to afford your medical bills. You can't say to someone, I love you and I don't care about how you're going to get the next meal on your table. To love anyone is to care for all of the things, then, that are necessary for their life to be sustained. And so scriptures do not call us to ignore those realities. They care very much about them. And each time in the book of Judges that it gets so bad among the people and they're crying out because things are getting stolen from them and they're afraid, God intervenes and answers because he cares not only about our souls, but also our bodies. He's the one that has given them both to us, and he's united them in such a way that everything that affects our soul affects our body, and everything that affects our body affects our soul. We can't separate those things completely. We can distinguish between them, but a human person is the unity of those two things, and so everything that affects our body and our soul matters. And so it, is, it matters when the right people get into positions of power and when laws begin to reflect God's will. Those are important things. But again and again, whoever makes it into power and whatever change they're able to implement, the limitations are there. It doesn't last. There's no sense that if just the right person gets in, we'll have unending trouble. And so... For us, even in a contemporary context, the scriptures would not encourage us to kind of isolate ourselves and have nothing to do with the outside world. But as people who take the scriptures seriously, as we engage questions of how to care for the elderly or the environment or how to provide for people's basic needs, and that leads us into discussions and likely disagreements about how to do that, a Christian 
should have a sense of humility in whatever their opinion is, that even if everything is done according to their way, it's not the answer to everyone's problems. And it can happen for all of us that eventually a form of idolatry creeps in where we believe that, no, if, if everyone would just do things the way we thought, or if only our candidates were in power, everything could go well. And the book of Judges just says again and again, no, <laughs> no, that, that probably won't happen. There's not ever been this period on earth where everyone obeys and everyone cooperates. And even when there are good leaders who come to power and there are years and decades of prosperity, there's a limit to that. It's not unending. Every generation has to fight its own battle of what its priorities are and what it's committed to and how it's going to care for people. But none of us just get to rest on the sacrifices of a previous generation. Uh, we all have something that we have to continue to do and maintain. And so the people of Israel, again, do what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And if, if, if we're all or nothing about this, we would look back to the first 12 chapters and see, see, that was all wasted. And all those people that stood up and said something and did something and ran out. See, they just went back into sin. And that's not the message that Judges is trying to communicate, that that was all wasted effort. No. Those were good people. They did great things. They helped a lot of people while they did that. But there is a limit to what any external influence can ultimately do to change human hearts. And no one person can actually obey for any other person. And we know, I mean, any of you, the responsibility of parenting, know you can set boundaries and set conditions and set discipline. But all along the way, you don't control internally what is in the heart of another person and what they desire to do from the inside out. Your hope is that you can affect things enough that eventually they desire and long to do good things. But you know you're limited in all the authority you have to affect the kind of change over the next 70 years that you might hope to see manifested. And that on your best day, you're still totally dependent upon the grace of God. So that what you are trying externally to encourage and shape is something that eventually internally is desired and longed for. All the effort in chapters 1 through 12 of people who were faithful in their generation to stand up against sin was not wasted. It was honoring to God. It was part of how he answered prayer. But he has not answered the prayer of anyone to bring about, via a political solution, perpetual, if you will, peace on earth. And it's still as we read the New Testament, not the expectation given to any of us as believers to assume will happen however we engage these larger questions. And so there's limits to political victory, but we see that there are amazing possibilities even in flawed people. <laughs> so when you read the book of Judges, it should temper all of us to recognize there are limits to what any of us can do via political solutions. But at the same time, it makes the case again and again that God can do things through very flawed people. There's no grand hero in the book of Judges that doesn't have a kink in his or her armor. And that's, again, where if we're sort of all or nothing people, and most of us, when we study history, whoever our heroes are, will discover that for all save one, we find out things about them that aren't beautiful and aren't lovely. That's part of the uniqueness as Christians that we submit to the world is that Christ is the one person that when you do a deep dive and hear everything he said and did and get access to his Twitter account and all of that and you say, what did he do in private and what did he do in public? He's the one person that study hard and he is consistent all the way through. Who he is is who he is. And every one else of us, if you dig into the closet and you get a little bit more access and a little bit more knowledge, you find out, wow, we've all said things we wish we didn't say. We've all done things we wish we wouldn't do. 
And that's the case for every person that we read in the book of Judges. For this story, we don't even get the sense that a specific prayer is being answered. The people have fallen into sin. It's extended for 40 years. And God takes all the initiative in communicating to a couple that is the way the text unfolds, they weren't even praying specifically for this, that we could say this is an answer to prayer. Almost as if they had experienced their childlessness for so long that it might not even have been a specific prayer request anymore in their life. And God comes in the form of an angel and says, you're going to have a kid. You're going to bear a son. Later, when they hear the news, they start asking more prayers and they get response to their prayers. But they are themselves people who would not necessarily raise their hands and say, God, you're going to do something through us. And we can tell you've got a plan for us. As far as they know, they don't see a future or a plan as far as their eyes can see. But God, to make a point that it's never about the people, but it's about him and what he's able to do, announces to them that a, a child will be born that they will bear a son. And with that, because it is this uh, surprising, intervening gift and grace of God, he puts a condition that this child is to be a Nazarite to God, which is a special provision in the law in the same chapter where we read the blessing that we uh, announced and prayed over the Coopers. is the same chapter where it talks about this Nazarite vow that not everyone was asked to do. Very few people were asked to do. It was supposed to be a voluntary commitment that people would make, usually defined for just a very short period of time. They wouldn't cut their hair. They wouldn't have any alcohol, wouldn't eat certain things for a specific purpose. But for this child, it is something that is spoken over him from birth and is supposed to be a lifelong commitment. And so the story of him having really long hair is a part of this, that this the angel has come and said, a child will be born, you will have a son, and these are the parameters in which he is to be reared. He is to be set aside for a special purpose that God has given. And as we read about this amazing, then the wife goes and tells her husband, and he's like, I want to hear that too. This is pretty amazing. Can any way the angel can come back? And the angel comes back, and still he's kind of left out of the conversation. And she says, he came again. What do you mean came again? He comes back, and is this really real? And they find out, yeah, this is something that's going to happen. The possibilities of what God can and will do through people that would think of themselves otherwise as flawed or broken, none of those are limitations to God. They're limitations to us, but they're not limitations to him. But we could get at the end then of chapter 13 and say, wow, this is going to be the story of almost like Jesus. <laughs> Now someone will be born that will just do everything right and not have any kinks in his armor and do any bad thing. And it, you're not very far into the next chapter before you realize, no, 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 that's not the case. God is up to something. He is working. He has the ability to do things through flawed people. But we don't then look at those flaws and one, begin to minimize them or begin to think that God doesn't care about them um, simply because they aren't for him limitations of what he can do. Whenever we choose to sin and wander away from his law and violate his commandments, there are profound consequences that come as a result of that. That scripture never makes light of sin. But the story again and again of Scripture is the announcement that even the sinfulness of people does not prevent God from being able to accomplish the things that he is seeking to accomplish. And that we're to receive that as good news. Because that is so much the temptation of our own sin. When we get caught in something and something's revealed about us, to then say, well, then I could never be good again. Or this could never have a chance of succeeding. Or we should just this. Like we have this tendency to think in the all or nothing categories. Instead of recognizing again and again, no, most people, if that was the case, as we read the 
stories as they unfold in Judges, and then Judges is just a snapshot of all of Scripture, uh, that God wouldn't have used anyone to do anything if that was the case. He just sort of said, no, you've all disqualified yourselves. I'm the only one who's going to act. But that's not how the story of Scripture unfolds. He is relentlessly willing to use broken and flawed and sinful people to accomplish his will. And so in times of victory, we're to remain humble. In times of sincere conviction and shame, we're still to remain humble and not think that we're so strong that our mistakes can thwart the almighty purposes of God. He's always God and we're not. He can do things we can't do, which is then what we're drawn to is the last conclusion, the wonder of God's grace. It's an amazing interaction when eventually Manoah says, so in the future, if everything you're saying comes true in this son's life, what's your name so that we can give you honor? whether that honor is in the form of an altar or whatever might be in his mind's imagination. And the response is, it's too wonderful for you. Which his response then is to acknowledge part of what is being alluded to and say, and to give a sacrifice for the God who works wonders. And as they prepare that sacrifice for the God who works wonders, the sacrifice is accepted, it's pleasable, it's pleasing, and as the very moment that they get confirmation that this really is the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord is gone. And they're left to wonder what what the future is going to hold. And here's the thing, whatever it holds, they've been given the confirmation that God is with them. That he's up to something. That this experience now for them of 40 years of being oppressed by the Philistines is something that God cares about and something that God will intervene in. And when they think they can't possibly be a part of the solution, he makes clear he's going to use them. And they discover in the future, even when the solution begins to manifest itself and there's all kinds of sin and ugliness involved in it, and many ways along the track that it could totally derail, it doesn't. God is still pursuing his people because he's the only one who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the one who is faithful. So in our sinful hearts, we could come to a book like this and just, I can't believe this is happening again. I can't believe they fell into this sin again. Instead of at a moment saying, I can't believe God keeps showing his love I can't believe he keeps having mercy I can't believe he keeps extending his grace it's a self-righteous person who can look and say I can't believe people are still putting up with you (laughs) it's someone who knows what it's like to be forgiven of their own sins to be a recipient of grace who over a lifetime of many valleys and mountaintops can look and say, I am amazed that God is still good to me. I am so thankful that he is still faithful. And I can't explain it. I just want to enjoy the wonder of his grace like I enjoy the wonder of a sunset. For the last couple of months, I don't know if you've seen, but in the evening sky, you can see two planets without a telescope. Jupiter and Venus are in the sky every night, and it's best to see it right at dusk because it's like the only star that you can see and then you realize that can't just be a star and I don't know if that happens all the time but this is the first time I've ever noticed it and so I just keep going out and like that's a planet I can see it what in the world and as often as I can if the boys haven't gone to bed say like come outside and just look I mean look at how bright that is I Someone else can probably explain it to me, and I can't and tell me exactly how often it happens. I don't know. But I'm just like, I don't want to miss it. (laughs) If this is something that only happens like once in my lifetime, I just want to enjoy that reality. And God's grace to us that we can't solve like a math problem or figure out that is never meant to excuse our sin, but is meant to keep us humble even in our times of victory is always something that he's worthy of our worship for. 
always because it is a wonder. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of life that not just for Samson and his parents could you come and announce that you were the author of life, but that for each and every one of us, you are the one who shapes and fashions us. You are the giver of all good things. That you work wonders every single day that we take for granted. And we grieve all the ways and times that we sin against you and your law and all the times that we neglect the good gifts that you have given to us. And we pray that you would convict us in our hearts to not be casual about any of the good things that you have given to us. But Father, we also pray that you would help us to always stand in wonder at your ongoing mercy and your ongoing grace. The possibilities that are endless for you when we feel that we're the, at the end of our imaginations even at the end of our prayers. And we thank you that even if we've reached a point of exhaustion and we aren't sure what or how to pray, that you can initiate and create and give out of the storehouse of your grace. So we thank you for it. We pray that you would use it in our lives to make us more <laughs> cheerful, more thankful more generous with all that you've given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand as we sing our closing song.
my God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. joy and the knowledge that he is mighty.